All right, then. Let's see, where are we? Mm. Yeah. Oh. So that's also something I'd briefly like to talk about in that context, um, which is how does Android actually work and in, look internally and what's encrypted basically, what's not. This is a lot easier to look at with Android than with iOS uh, because yeah, in that uh, case it actually helps that Android is partly open source because you can look at the, the different parts a lot easier. So when you start up your Android device then it will first uh, load a piece of software called Fastboot. So you have different kinds of yeah, partitions on your flash memory which contain different types of software. And that fast boot is basically the bootloader which does the very first step of starting up the device. You can already connect to that bootloader via USB, um, but for that to work, it generally has to be unlocked. So the bootloader itself has some kind of command which unlocks it and then you can talk to it via USB. And um, if that, is enabled, then you can basically read and change all the other components. Um, the implementation currently looks like this on most devices, that if you unlock the bootloader, then it will erase all the data on the phone. And afterwards, then you uh, uh, basically can do with it whatever you want. The idea here is, um, so if you want to unlock it, then if it's your own phone, then you can, of course, save the data beforehand. If it's somebody else's phone, then you can't use the uh, bootloader to actually access uh, somebody else's data because it will be erased as soon as you unlock the bootloader. So that's the idea. But of course, there may be bootloaders, for example, which have some kind of bug um, that allows them to be unlocked without erasing the data, maybe. Um, after the bootloader is done, then it will either start the regular Linux kernel of a partition called boot, which will then pass control onto the actual system. Um, and once the system is running, it will uh, use this partition called data, where the actual data, you, your apps, your contacts, and so on is stored. And this partition is the one that gets erased when you unlock the bootloader. Um, there's also, in addition to those partitions, there's also one, uh, one extra which is called recovery. This is basically a very minimal Linux system but on its own, which allows you to, for example, reflash the system. So when some kind of operating system has gone bad, then you should be able to boot into that recovery and um, reflash, for example, just the, the system partition uh, so with, with the version prior. So you can basically downgrade again. So um, you have quite a number of, of uh, locations where you can basically try to get into such a device. So you could try to use the bootloader, you could try to use the recovery, you could try to use the regular system. So this is also the reason why it's usually um, regarded as a security issue if you, uh, if you root your Android system. Because any app that's, that has root access here on this uh, system uh, will be able to access all of the other partitions, all of the other data, and it will uh, especially be able to bypass uh, the internal protect, uh, protection mechanisms of Android. I've already mentioned this. Uh, the basic idea of Android is to isolate each app by using its own UID. But of course, if you uh, have root access, then these protections don't, don't apply anymore and the app would be able to read out all of the other data. If you have some kind of backup app, for example, then it might actually make sense for that to have root access because otherwise it wouldn't be able to actually backup data from the other apps, but it's still a security risk, of course. So this is always something um, to keep in mind here. Okay. So we still need a little time today, so I will 
skip over this. We actually talked about most of this already. Um, so finally, we to, to wrap things up today, we talked about a lot of problems. Now let's maybe briefly look in, into, into possible solutions also. So how could you basically do encryption properly? If you have anything more than four digits of pins, then users will really uh, start to dislike that very quickly. So um, there was a, while I was at Siemens, there was a big discussion if we should uh, require people to use five-digit pins on their devices, and that was actually already that decision was scrapped because people would simply be too annoyed to actually do it. So um, it remained at four digits, uh, which is not very secure, as we already seen. So um, even if you don't uh, have any kind of, of uh, sophisticated supercomputer to crack your data, um, people have sometimes just built uh, uh, basically a, a kind of primitive robot that will enter all possible pins. And after 10 hours or something like that, the device will be unlocked anyway. So four digits really isn't a very high level of protection. Um, the ideal solution would be to use some kind of two-factor authentication. So that's a combination of something you know, the pin, and something you own. And that can be, for example, the, the pattern in your iris, or that can be uh, a wireless token. Uh, all of this might be possible. The big drawback, again, is that you usually need some kind of extra hardware for that to work, which is not built into regular mobile phones. So the wireless token might be actually the, the most promising approach here. So you could just have something that's, that's maybe on your key ring, which is, uh, has a very short range of maybe a meter or two. And as long as your device is within range of that token, then you uh, uh, can use that to, to basically supplement the pin and increase your security. Um, in terms of communication, it would be, uh, of course, desirable to always use end-to-end -end encryption, something like HTTPS, for example. The drawback with HTTPS, again, is that it's really a very complex protocol. Um, and there are a large number of failure modes which you have to account for, and basically nobody, nobody can cover all of, the, uh, all of them. So just about every app that uses HTTPS or every operating system has some kind of flaw that uh, will uh, enable a really sophisticated attacker to gain access to the data after all. It's just a, a question of how much effort you need to put into it to, to actually uh, to actually crack, crack the, the encryption. Um, so what could, you do, what could we do in terms of cloud services? We can, of course, uh, try to use something like pure peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, but that's a big problem on mobile devices because as soon as you have peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, um, you will need a lot of bandwidth. Um, and for that reason, that's not really feasible. What you can try to do is if you use something like Dropbox, then there are tools like Box Crypto, for example, which allow you to have your own encryption on top of Dropbox. Um, but then again, the trade-off is that if you want to give someone else access to your Dropbox files, then you will also need to give them the key somehow, and they will also need to install Box Crypto, so it gets a little more difficult again. Um, yeah, cloud providers aren't actually that keen on you encrypting all, the, all your data because that kind of goes against their business model in many cases. Um, and I've already mentioned this, if you want the cloud provider to actually do something with your data for you, then of course they need access to it. There are uh, concepts in crypto known as uh, zero knowledge protocols or zero knowledge encryption where the provider can still process your data for you while it's encrypted without actually ever being able to decrypt it. Um, but that's not something that's currently 
ever used in, in, in the wild, so in a, in a real world application. This is still very much a, a research concept. Um, so, in terms of, of data protection, we talked about this at length already, that you can't have uh, fine granular control over your permissions. What would be interesting, uh, and what I've seen uh, implemented once or twice, is to, um, if you deny an app access to a specific permission, then from the point of view of the app, it will still look as if it got the permission, it will just be supplied with fake data. So for example, there's just a list of fake contacts that's uh, randomly generated on your device. And when you don't want to give an app access to your, uh, to your contacts, but the app basically insists on it, then you can say, okay, no, uh, I don't want to give it access to the real contact list, but it will just get access to some fake contact list that's randomly generated on your device. Of course, depending on what app is, it is, some features might not work then, but it would still be better than the current approach where the app usually just doesn't work at all. Uh, or just repeatedly bugs you with a, with a, a request to, to give it access after all. So also not something that's yet really been, been implemented, but something that's, uh, that might be interesting to consider for the future to actually generate, you could also generate fake camera data, for example, it really wants access to the camera for whatever reason, so that might be an interesting idea to look into. Um, finally, in terms of transparency, well, which was one of the problems I listed earlier, there are uh, attempts to create really completely open source devices where you really can examine every individual bit of software that's running. So there's, for example, Replicant, which is basically taking the open source parts of Android and tries to uh, uh, add the rest uh, Two, so for example, you can have open source drivers for all of the components on your phone. Um, of course, it only works for very few devices currently because it's just a lot of effort to write these drivers. But you can actually in, uh, examine them individually. There's uh, the open Moco phone and there's also the, the free phone, I think, which try to also give you access to all of the software in, in case of the free phone. And in case of the open Moco, you can actually get access to the schematics, to the design files for the case. So you can really build the entire phone from scratch by yourself uh, if, you, if you invest enough time and, and material, of course. But you can uh, really uh, examine the phone down to each individual wire on the, on the circuit board. And uh, finally, there's also um, this Osmocom, which I already mentioned, which is an open source implementation of uh, the GSM stack and by now also parts of UMTS. Uh, so you can basically use that to run your own base station and you can uh, there are some phones where you can also install that on the device itself, so you don't have to rely on anything like the closed baseband module to actually talk to the wireless network. But um, again, the hardware support is really very limited. As far as I know, uh, the only phones which, which, open, uh, uh, which Osmocom runs on are some very old Motorola phones not even smartphones. Um, so there's still a lot of, of work to be done here, basically. All right, so I think that's it for today. Are there any further, further questions or comments? Um, anything related to the papers? Uh, it took a bit longer than I expected today. Are there any, any questions about the, the project papers which you'd like to have answered. No? Oh, okay, then, yeah, thanks for listening, and I guess see you on Friday. <laughs> <laughs>